So I, I don't really care for this thing because it's just kind of in the way, but right now it's the best thing to be able to record. So Skip, can you hear me okay back there? <clears throat> well, the other issue is fortunately the ice maker stopped for a moment, but that will kick in. So we'll figure things out as we move along. I do want to tell you that starting next week, you can come in this store, all right? Because what they have to do is they have to unlock those doors so you can come in, which is fine. But because we're down here, that means they unlock the door and people could wander. And so, yeah, <laughs> okay. So I'll try to remember to put a note on there just pointing you here and they're unlocked that door. Uh, to make it easier next week next week okay. and then we'll decide in the future if we want to stay in this room or not um, I don't know how you feel I mean I kind of like it because of the tables but we're, we're look around and see what other options there are it's just I feel in competition with the ice maker I, I kind of thought about unplugging it but I thought yeah I wondered about that but then I might get in trouble so well, the ice maker's right there. That's the problem, so. Anyway, uh, maybe if you unplug it. It's probably going to break though, that's what I Just remember to plug it back. Yes, yes, that's great. Okay, so let me see if there are any other announcements I needed to, to make. Um, thank you for your patience with not meeting last week. I saw the doc doctor about my carpal tunnel that I believe I have. And I'm going to have the test done August 9th, I think it is. They do a little electronic thing to see where it's firing and not firing. And then I see the doctor on the 11th. They'll decide what to do then. But they gave me these wrist guards that I wear at bed at night. They're really attractive, you know. But it actually, you know, helps. You know, once I take them off, they start getting numb again. But um, it's, it's not, it's, it feels a little bit you know better so we'll see what happens but thank you what's that <laughs> yes <laughs> you know well it's a, it's a real problem when you want to pick your nose it's like uh, you know so anyway i um, i think i as i mentioned to you in august i forget the exact date the thursday in august second week gee, it might be the 11th when i get to see the doctor but i think that's later in the day um, I believe we're going to start a new class and we're going to do a study on the attributes of God and I'm really excited about it Pastor Glenn was excited about it and so there's plenty of attributes of God and I'm convinced that that's one of the most important things I think if you as it says in Jeremiah I forget where it is that's one of my favorite verses seven or nine or wherever let not the wise man boast of his wisdom or the rich man boast of his riches or the strong man boast of his strength but let him who boasts boast in this that he knows and understands that I'm a God that exercises justice righteousness and something else in these things I delight so it's one thing to know the Lord and coming to a relationship with him of knowing him in that intimate way but then he says understand how is Jamaica Oh my goodness. Well, take your start your break right here. That's right. I had to that. So he he delights in us knowing and understanding him. So we're spend a whole session talking about what it means to know the Lord, and then we'll talk about I don't have it written out yet, the sovereignty of God, the holiness of God, the justice of God, the grace of God, the you know, incomprehensibility of God, the omnipresence of God. I mean, you see, there's a lot of rich, rich things. And I am just so convinced when you get to really know who your God is, it, I don't want to say it eliminates anxiety because we all deal with anxious things now and then. But when you know who your God is, it really puts things in perspective as far as being discouraged or whatever. And again, I know we all deal with discouragement and anxiety but it really does help so anyway that's what we're going to be doing so let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into our study our father and our god thank you for this beautiful beautiful morning it is the day that you've made so we will rejoice and be glad in it 
thankful for all these folks that have come out today to hear your word. I pray, Lord, you bless this time as we look at this magnificent psalm that speaks of the coming Messiah, that come, talks about his crucifixion so very clearly. Lord, I pray that you would guide our conversation, that, Lord, this would be a, a blessed time that we might leave this place with just a deeper appreciation of the providence of God, how you've arranged things before the foundations of the earth uh, to glorify your name and to bring your children into your presence. So, Father, just bless this time. Be with your people today. Lord, uh, whatever their needs may be, I pray that you lift up folks that may be discouraged. Lord, help those who are anxious to cast all of their anxieties upon you because you care for them. Those who are struggling with health issues, we pray you be with them. Lord, we're thankful that Skip's elbow surgery went well. We pray you continue to bounce back from that. Others, Lord, in our group that may be struggling today, we ask that you please be with them. Father, thank you for your amazing grace towards us. And I do pray that you be glorified uh, as we spend this time with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, it was suggested two weeks ago that we look at the 22nd Psalm, which is absolutely one of the most amazing Psalms in the entire Psalter. It's, a, it's another name for the book of Psalms, mainly because it so clearly affirms the Messiahship of Jesus Christ 1,000 years before he was born. There may be, I, I, I didn't count, six to ten direct references in this psalm <clears throat> to the crucifixion that are just, have to be beyond a doubt that it's talking about Jesus. And as we read this, and as we talk about it, I know the thought that across your mind will be, the one that always crosses my mind, is how can people not see this? I mean, if, if you were to sit down with a Jewish friend, and we're gonna talk about the Jewish interpretation of this, which is gonna blow your mind. But when you sit down with a, a Jewish friend and take him through Isaiah 53, or take him through this Psalm, and say, don't you see that's clearly Jesus? And show them in the New Testament, they still won't see it. Why not? God of this world has blinded their eyes. Yeah, the God, God of this world has blinded their eyes. They're in darkness. There's a veil over them. And the same thing was true with you, even though you weren't Jewish, is that, listen, let me ask you. How many of you, I've asked this question before, how many of you were brought up in the church so you came to know the Lord at a young age? Hi, ladies. Good to see you. Okay, let me ask the question again. How many of you were brought up in a Christian and church environment? Might not have been perfect, but you knew and heard the gospel at an early age. And as far as you know, if I were to say to you, when did you come to faith? You'd say, mm, I've always believed. Now, you always didn't believe. There's a point where the Lord spoke life into you, but I get what you're saying, is that, you know, you... Were brought, so how many of you have been brought up in that environment? Okay, a couple of you. So how many of you then came to faith later in life? All right. So how many of you prior to your conversion, if you heard the gospel, if someone told you about Jesus, if, if you even read the Bible or whatever, and someone tried to convince you that you just shook your head and said, no. Nah, don't get it, not real, can't believe it. Sure, he was a historical figure, can't deny that, but eh, his disciples and others just, you know, made up stories to add to it. I mean, you just didn't get it. But one day, you came to faith, and not that you understood everything, but you believed, that you believed, it was like, I get it. You know, I told you before, I was brought up in the Northern Presbyterian Church where I believed the Bible, I believed the Trinity, I believed the Apostles' Creed, I believed those things to be true. I had, as we talked about, an census faith, 
I knew the facts about Jesus, believed them to be true, but if you really, really pressed me about it, you know, I would say, well, there's some things I guess I really don't know about. I don't know if that really happened or, or whatever. And if you asked me who Jesus was, I would have clearly said, Son of God, died on the cross, rose from the dead, forgave me my sins. Yet I did not have, I believe, a saving relationship with him. I had this working knowledge of him like you would know any, if you, anyone here know a political figure personally? Anyone, even a local, you know, person? Okay, well, if you know someone well known, anyone know a celebrity? Anyone here of Christian guitarist Phil Keggy? Yeah. Okay, Phil Keggy and I are, are friends. So uh, we would write each other. I mean, he's been stayed at my house and he's played at my church a number of times. And that's all because Pastor Lloyd first brought him here and things such as that. So we have a, a friendship. We don't contact each other a lot, but I, you know, I could write him. I have his private phone number and I can write him about something. He'd write me, you know, back. So I have this relationship with him that's more than just, I'm a fan, you know, of his. Well, that's how it is with uh, a lot of people who would call themselves Christians. They have this head knowledge. I'm acquainted with him, but I really don't know him. I, I really don't know him. And so that's what we're dealing with. When, when you read this psalm, you say, what else could this possibly mean? And when we get to the Jewish interpretation of this, I think you're going to be shocked you know by it that they when you ask them what does this mean they're going to give you an explanation that does not fit anywhere in here but that's neither here nor there we will see that okay so let's look at this 22nd psalm the first thing we see is the superscription of course and we see that it was written let me turn to it i'm talking to you about it but i all have it in front of me it says here For the director of music, of course, what does that mean? It's a song. Director of music in the temple is to either sing it for them or they are to learn it, you know, and certainly read it. And it says, to the tune of the dough of the morning. Isn't that fascinating? Is this unknown song that when this was written, they knew what that was. Now, I did read one interesting commentary on this, and this person's reading into it, but it's okay, but it's interesting, is that he thinks this uh, dough of the morning. Okay, let me just ask you. I'm assuming that you, we're going to read it in a second, but I'm assuming you've read the psalm and familiar with it, and hopefully you read it in the last week or so. Is it a happy psalm? Is it joyful? No, at the end, the last part of it, it's, it's praise, but it's, we're talking about someone being crucified. We're talking about being surrounded by dogs, that they're hurling insults at them. They're uh, gambling for his clothes. And so it's not a happy, so this is not a, uh, Anne's been around for a while in the early days, but uh, happy, 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 happy are the children who, God is the Lord. Any remember that song? And where do these happy people come from? Jesus. Okay. Well, that's probably a kid song. And you just made me sing that. <laughs> now it's going to be on video forever. So maybe it's a king song, a kid song. But we would sometimes sing that usually on a Wednesday night or Sunday night. We'll pass the Lloyd's drum and the guitar. And it was just kind of an energetic sort of thing. This song, this psalm is not sung that way. So this one commentator was speculating that the dough of the morning could possibly be a mournful song about a doe, a deer, a female deer. Wait, Ray, a drop of, okay, I'm sorry. I'm just gonna break into another song. Um, but here's a, a doe who in the early morning awakens or whatever the case may be and finds itself alone. 
alone in the morning and looking out for its family, looking out for some protection, and now is fearful that it's going to be attacked by the wolves, by the dogs, by, you know, whatever. And that was just this person's interpretation, taking it from the fact that it's a mournful psalm, that this tune must be a mournful tune, you know, at, uh, at all. So let's read this psalm. And then we're going to talk about its history, context, interpretation. Now, before I read it, I know that you all know that this is about the Messiah, Jesus Christ. But I'm asking you to do your very best to listen to this as a Jew a thousand years ago. You're hearing it for the first time. I sometimes think of like when I read Paul's letters that before I start, I say to myself, okay, I'm gonna to try to imagine I'm sitting in the church at Ephesus. I'm there on a Lord's day to worship the Lord and the president, that's what the pastor was called in the early church history, the president is now going to preach and he says, we've received a manuscript, a letter from the apostle Paul and he's asked me to read this to the church. So let's hear what the Lord has spoken to, to Paul. And that you read it and you think, I'm sitting in the congregation, so I'm listening to this. He's speaking to me and everyone else in the church. He's speaking to me. So you try to listen to it with new ears. Now, when we read this Psalm, we're reading this 3,000 years after it was written. So who was it written to? The Jews. Okay, the Jews of that time. Written by, it says, a Psalm of David. Written by David. So when this is now going to be sung or read for the first time or whatever, is that the Jews are hearing this for the first time. David has composed it. And I don't know how it worked. If, if David composed things and just kind of kept them on his desk, off to the side, filed in a file, whatever. And then some day he was having a conversation with one of the sons of Asaph and he said, you know, some of this poetry is really beautiful. We need to be singing this in the temple. I don't know how it worked, you know, but, or if it was like, you know, Bernie Taupin and Elton John, forgive the very poor analogy, but it just came to my head, is that, Bernie Taupin wrote all the lyrics for Elton John, so he'd show up at Elton's house and say, here's my next poem. What can you do with it? And literally, he would sit at the piano and look at the words and look at the beat and the meter of it and go, you know, and, and write something. So I don't know if David runs it to the temple and says, hey, fresh off the, my typewriter here, you know, and let's, let's sing it. So try your best to, if possible, to forget about the messianic overtures that are here and listen with as much as possible with an open mind as if you're hearing it for the very first time. Do your best not to think of it as a psalm that's absolutely about the Messiah because there's nothing in here that says this is about the future Messiah who will die for our sins on a cruel death. There's nothing that says that. There's nothing that identifies this. You know how some of the superscriptions will say uh, a Psalm of David after Nathan confronted him? Yeah. See, you, you know the context right there. Or in the actual Psalm, the Psalmist will say, this is what's happening. As I ran from my enemies, literally. So we don't know what the context is, you know, at, at this point. So again, that's a long introduction to try to help you read, listen to this with an, an open mind. I know when you, you're gonna hear me say certain things go, oh, that's Jesus. Try to think of yourself as a Jew. All right, I'm gonna read the whole song. That's all 31 verses. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? 
Oh my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, and am not silent. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel. If in you our fathers put their trust, they trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were saved. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. But I am a worm, not a man, scorned by men, a despised and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth, I was cast upon you. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions tearing their prey open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my joints are out of all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax, it is melted away within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth and you lay me in the dust of death. Dogs have, surround, have surrounded me. A band of evil men have encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. But you, O Lord, be not far off. O my strength, come quickly to help me. Deliver my life from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lion. Save me from the horns of wild oxen. I will declare your name to my brothers. In the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or disdained the suffering of the afflicted, the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. For from, from you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you will I fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and will be satisfied. They who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord and the families of the nations will bow down before him for dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who, all who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive. Prosperity, prosperity will serve them. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness to the to a people yet unborn for he has done it okay now that is just absolutely uh, you know amazing and i know you know it's amazing but let me ask you what is going on here what is happening what is the context now remember who wrote this David. Now, one might say, and I don't think this is the case. Um, you, you've heard of when 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 the scripture was written. There, there's this uh, occultic um, uh, practice of. Uh, I think it's called automatic writing. Is that what it's called? Have you ever are you familiar with this at all? Where. Um, Edgar Casey, familiar with Edgar Casey? Edgar Casey was a fellow back when, ooh, 1800s? Yeah, 1800s, who I think started out as a believer or called himself a Christian, but got himself really whacked out. I, I used to know a lot more about him, but it's been years since I thought about him. I just thought about him right now. But one thing that he would do was his automatic writing, where he'd have a pen or pencil in hand and he'd get into a trance and he and he just start writing and that 
you know, the, the teachings of Agro Casey, you know, were all written down here, stuff like that. But they were, where, where did that come from? Well, it either came from himself or it came from the devil, you know, because it was nothing God glorifying or whatever. But automatic writing is a technique that spiritualists will use to say that this is how, you know, I'm getting a message. I mean, in a sense, it's kind of like the Ouija board. How's the Ouija board work? I've never, ever, ever played with one, but it's supposed to spell out your words because the, you know, and, and they, some say the makers of it, whoever makes it will say, you know, it's the power of suggestion that you know the answer, so you're moving it there subconsciously, whatever. Uh, I have my beliefs about it, you know, whatever. Don't mess with Ouija boards, you know. But the scriptures were not written by someone sitting down and going, oh, oh, the Lord's telling me something. And they just start writing. And they have no idea what they're writing and they just, they just write, okay? That yes, I believe that when Paul wrote from prison that he was singing praises to the Lord and was, you know, in, a, in the spirit, but I don't mean anything weird. And then just felt, I need to write to my brothers in Colossae because I'm hearing concerns that they're having over there of some false teachings that are in there. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna write to them. And the Lord inspired, you know, that. But usually, especially in the Old Testament, when you look at the Psalms, David isn't just, all right, Lennon McCartney, Bernie Taupin, and Elton John, they're sit down and go, what am I gonna write about today? And if you're a Beatle fan like I am, the Sgt. Pepper song, Being for the Benefit of Mr. Kite, is all about a circus. So you go, where'd they get this idea from? Literally, John and Paul were sitting in John's house and John had on the wall a very old advertisement for a circus. Later, Pablo Fanky's fair, you know, I'm trying to remember the words, but all these words, Harry the horse would be there, you know, and all of these things. And he, he just looks at it and says, all right, let's have some fun. I mean, John Lennon would write some of the weirdest words and he'd do it on purpose because he knew that colleges in England were studying his writing, were studying his lyrics because of the deep thinker that he was. And he just laughed at them and said, all right, I'll give him something to talk about. You know, cuckoo kachoo, I am the walrus. You know, he's just coming up with words that sound good, you know, together to get him, you know, get him going. So when we read the Psalms, when we read something from the pen of David, he's writing about something he's experiencing. For the most part, something he's experiencing. Now, was David crucified? No. Was David's hands and feet pierced? No. As far as we know, you know, I mean, we know he wasn't crucified because crucifixion didn't come to a thousand years later. Rome came up with that, you know, idea. Now. There might have been something going on with David being attacked by his enemies and, you know, they jab him in his side. My, you know, my water pours out of me or, you know, they jab me, teasing me in my feet or, or whatever. Who knows? But somehow David knew to write about, you know, these things. But we don't know anything about the context. We don't know anything about what's really going on. So you might be wondering what did the Jews of the past and the present think about this? Now, I didn't have an opportunity. One of my high school friends, Enid, I'm no longer on Facebook, but Becky is, so we could have written Enid, you know, through, through Becky, and I just didn't think to do this, but I've done it in the past, where I've asked Enid, as my Jewish friend, I got a number of Jewish friends, her cousin's a rabbi. And so in the past, and I've, I've been kind of slick with it, is that I knew I could find the answer in, in my books or the internet. But I thought, well, I'd like to hear what a rabbi would say, but also it would get Enid thinking about these things. So I would write, I would write her or talk to her and say, Enid, could you ask your cousin, you know, I remember asking him about what did Jews believe about a resurrection, about an afterlife? I'm curious as to what he has to say about it. 
And so he gave, she gave me his email address. He was glad to talk with me. So we had a little interchange back and forth. And he flat out said that most Jews don't believe in a resurrection, an afterlife. Is that what they believe is that you live on through your legacy, through your family, that there's no real, you know, afterlife. And of course, I wrote back to him and said, okay, well, that's interesting, but if, if there's no afterlife, then what are we living for? Why don't we, as the philosophers said of old, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we shall die? If there's no consequences, if there's no rewards or punishments, then why bother being nice to people? Why not take whatever you can when you have the opportunity to, if there's no consequences to it? You know, and he kind of hemmed around it as well. So I thought of, but I didn't, I thought about it way too late. I was curious as what the rabbi would say about this. But I did find out what some have said traditionally about this. Now, you remember a couple of weeks ago or somewhere in there, I mentioned to you a, uh, a Jewish word called the midrash. Midrash is not a virus or something you got on your stomach here, a midrash. Midrash was a commentary written in the early, maybe second or third century. It was a, basically, how many own a study Bible? You have a Bible, the text, and underneath it, there's a note about that. Now, I love study Bibles. I have a number of different ones. They're very helpful because they're scholarly, but you gotta be careful of making the study notes what you're reading more than the word itself. But it's someone's interpretation, commentary, you know, about it. Well, the Midrash is a, I might be saying it wrong, but it's a Jewish commentary on the scriptures, on the Old Testament scriptures. But see, they take it as gospel. I mean, they, they take it as, well, if the rabbi said it, if the rabbis of the past would say, and often in the Midrash, and I'm gonna read you an example, Rabbi Jones said what Rabbi Ed said because Rabbi Joe said. And then, and see, that's how it was passed down. So it's just these, excuse me, these rabbis' interpretations of things. So, let me tell you what history, Jewish history has indicated Anyone want to take a guess? Anyone want to take a wild guess? I wish I had a prize for you. Take a wild guess of what you think this is about. And the ice machine stoppeth. So, kind of. Okay. Well, they say either it's about King David, of course, and going through some struggle. That's logical. Or it's about the Israeli people in general of the hardship they've gone through. It's a little too specific. The same thing with King David. Or the most popular view is this is about Queen Esther. I'm, I'm gonna read to you literally what the Midrash says, you know, uh, about it. They believe it's a royal figure. Again, usually King David or Queen Esther. The Midrash, this commentary says, it's about Queen Esther and imagines Queen Esther reciting Psalm 22 the moment she's about to enter her husband, the king, King Xerxes, you know, presence. Now, do you remember the story of Esther? Very, very quickly. It's a beautiful, beautiful, I think I preached 15 sermons going, going through the book of Esther. It's just a beautiful book. God's name's never mentioned once in it but you see God's providence all in it. Real brief version of it is that um, uh, Haman is, is a royal figure and he has a quarrel with um, Mordecai, who's the adopted, he's the uncle, they say, uncle or cousin of Queen Esther. This is during the Babylonian captivity. Put it more in perspective. You remember in Ezra and Nehemiah, the Jews came back. They were allowed to go back from King Cyrus and rebuild the walls and then the temple. Well, not all the Jews went back. Some Jews stayed in Babylon, which was now no longer the Babylonians, but now the Persians ran it. 
And so there was a couple, Cyrus was the king. And so life was pretty good for him. After all this time, most of them, they were not in bondage. They were not in, in Egypt as slaves. They're living a decent life in Persia. So a lot of the Jews didn't go back. That's the time frame of Queen Esther. And the sad reality of it is that they were so used to living in this Persian community now, they never even talked about God. That's why God's name's never mentioned in it. So Haman has an issue with Mordecai, and they believe it's because of their heritage going back generations of Haman's people. I forget, I'm sorry, what pagan group it was, and Mordecai being the Jews, that there was a hatred between them. So Mordecai sitting outside the gate and Haman doesn't like him. So Haman can, I'm cutting through the story here. Haman convinces the king to come up with an edict that the people must, I've forgotten already, bow down to Xerxes? Bow down to the king. Yeah. Bow down to the king. Okay, is that what it was? Or that the Jews wouldn't do that. Right. Yeah, and the Jews wouldn't do that. So if you didn't do it, you'd be put to death. Well, that was all the Jews because he didn't like the Jews. Well, the king didn't realize that his queen was Jewish because back up, Xerxes got rid of his queen. What is it, Vashti? Because Vashti wouldn't dance at a dinner party. They had a drunken dinner party. Most believe it's because he wanted her to dance naked and she wouldn't do it. And so she was booted out and put to death. They had a beauty contest. Esther wins. Esther's Jewish and he doesn't know it. And so Mordecai, when this edict comes out that all the Jews are gonna be put to death on this certain day, Mordecai says to Esther, don't think that you're gonna get away with this. If this passes, we die, you die too. Maybe, uh, how's the beautiful verse go? For just this moment, just at the time is this, and a beautiful picture of God's providence that she was made queen for this main reason. So she has to go in to see the king, to plead with him. Now, you think, what's the big deal? He just goes in and talks to the king and says, hey, you didn't realize I'm Jewish, and Haman has this crazy idea, there's nothing wrong with our people, you think everything would be fine. But you didn't just walk uninvited into the royal, into the throne room. If you walked in, the king's not in a good mood, and he doesn't extend his gold scepter to you, you're put to death. That could very well happen to Queen Esther. But when she walks in, turn to Esther, okay? It's just before Job. Go to chapter 5. Page 440 in my Bible. Uh, Esther 5.1. On the third day, okay, let me back up. So what Esther decides to do when she's given this responsibility by Mordecai and is guilted into it, she fasts. Now there's one religious reference. It doesn't say fast to God, it just says fast. She went on a fast for three days. So at the end of three days, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall, facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her and held out to her the gold scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. Then the king asked, what is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be given you. So here, Esther, understandably, is a little nervous about going in. But she's fasted, we hope that she's prayed as well, and now, and, and the king has already said he adored her, but you just don't know what kind of mood he's in. So we sta she's standing in the royal garments, he sees her, he's overjoyed. Come on in, extend skill, whatever you want is yours. And then they go through a little game of, I'm gonna have a dinner party, et cetera, et cetera. The bottom line is, the Jews win in the end. Okay, so with that in mind, this is what they, they say. They believe, the Jews believe that Queen Esther is reciting this psalm, this 22nd psalm, as she's entering in. That it says, and this is from the Midrash, Esther 
appraised of the danger posed to the Jews by Haman, fasts for three days and goes to speak to her husband, King Xerxes. On the third day, this is their uh, rewriting of it. On the third day, Esther put on royal apparel or robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace facing the king's palace while the king was sitting on his royal throne in the throne room facing the entrance of the palace. The Midrash interprets this by saying, does it need, does it need to tell you about her royal apparel? Rabbi Eliezer said, that Rabbi Chaniah said, the teacher that this teaches you that she donned the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to see what, how they're reading into this. Is that it tells us she put on her royal robes. Why would she put on her royal robes? Well, she's going to see the king. And so it's a reminder to the king this is the queen. So it's only natural. I mean, if you're called in to see the president, if you're called in to see the pope, you're called in to see anyone, you know, of, of some stature, the queen of England, I'm pretty sure you're not going to go in shorts and flip-flops. Uh, you might. Queen's a pretty gracious lady, but chances are you're going to dress up. So she dresses up in her outfit, but the Jewish interpretation is that she put on... It says here, she put on. So that means they put on the Holy Spirit. Where do they get that from? Well, in 1 Chronicles 12, 19, then the Spirit came on Amasai, chief of the 30, and said, we are yours, David. We are with you, son of Jesse. Success, success to you, and success to those who help you. For your God will help you. So David received them and made them leaders of his raiding bands. Now, for some reason, because that verse in Chronicles says that the Spirit came on Amasai, that the rabbi says because she put on her royal clothes, it's the same thing. That she put on the Holy Spirit. Now, boy, if that's not reading way, way too much into it. Um, it says, then it continues in the Midrash, although Esther enters the palace with the Holy Spirit, it soon disappears. Okay? Yes. The, it, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, but it does say it. Okay? Says Rabbi Levi in uh, AD 200, when she, Esther, came to the house of idols, the divine present departed from her. In other words, here she dons the Holy Spirit. She gets dressed in the royal robes, which they say is the Holy Spirit. But as she enters the palace area, because the palace is a, a, a den of idols, they're pagans, that the Holy Spirit says, oh, I'm not going in there. And the Holy Spirit leaves her. This is why she says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken or abandoned me? Now, do you see how they're reading into this? First, they're implying that putting on the royal robes means the Holy Spirit's on her. And because she says, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why have you forsaken me? That must mean the Holy Spirit said, uh-uh, I'm not going in there because it's a place of, of demons. So in the biblical text, Esther's hesitation to enter the palace is obviously clear. Entering the king's inner courts uninvited is a capital offense, offense unless the king, as you know, extends the royal scepter. But the Midrash reads more into this dramatic moment and sees her pause as a reflection of the divine spirit leaving her. So she responds by reciting this 22nd Psalm. That she just remembers it because it was written by David and she says all this as she's, she's going into it. So you're, you're wondering how in the world do they, do they get that? She says in the Midrash, with Esther attempting to understand why the spirit left her, 
what was done under compulsion like that done willingly. Here Esther notes that the sin of entering the idol-laden palace is being committed under duress. And she asked God not to treat her as if she was a purposeful sinner. In other words, that Esther is crying out to God, oh God, why have you forsaken me? Please don't leave me here. I didn't deliberately sin by coming into the palace. I've come here for a good purpose to save the Jews, so please don't hold this against me. And that's what they say this Psalm is about. And then it goes on to say, or perhaps it's because this is they're quoting Esther, although Esther never said it, that maybe Esther said, I called him Xerxes a dog, as it says, save my life from the sword, my precious life from the clutches of a dog. Psalm 22, uh, Psalm 22, 21. Well, it doesn't say that it says dogs. And then she changes her mind and says, oh no, because I called him a dog, now I'm in trouble. So then she calls him a lion, deliver me from the lion's mouth, from the horns of the wild oxen, rescue me. Now let's read that all in content, uh, context. Look at Psalm 22 and look at verse 16. Let's read 15 first. So I want you to imagine now, this is Esther. This is Esther. Um, let's start in verse 13. Roaring lions tearing their prey open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted away within me. Now before I read any further, I mean that's a horrible depiction there, but do we see that in Esther? No, Esther walks up, King Caesar, welcome, my queen. Where, where's all this anxiety? Where's all this incredible fear that she's supposed to have? My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. I mean, is Esther really going through that? You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men have encircled me. They pierced my hands and my knees. I count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. Where is all of this happening in Esther? That, there's, there's no way this is even close to it. Jump down to 26, uh, 20. Deliver my life from the sword. Okay, I get that. She may be fearful of, of death. Um, my precious life in the power of the dogs. So she says, oh, that, that's the king. Yes, ma'am, sir. My is dog, singular. dog singular? Okay, good. Because mine here says dogs and has a, a reference note to it to probably say it's another interpretation. Rescue me from the mouth of the lion. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. Again, is all of that going on? There's no evidence that there are soldiers standing around with spears ready to get her, threatening her, piercing her hands and her feet. So you see how this is so read into, it's read into it, that it's it's just, to me, it's beyond, you know, and, and she's wondering why the Holy Spirit has, you know, has left her, you know, here. So, again, um, Esther's back and forth in their mind here is, is again based on the verses of Psalm 22 underscoring how the rabbis are reading the entire lament not just the opening verses as Esther's lament you know about that so I don't know if any of you have any serious Jewish connections that you can you can ask them what is going on here and I'm sure the rabbi has been confronted with this with, by other people, so they'll have an answer for you. But their answer is, this is about Esther. But when you look at all that it's telling you here about being pierced, about your garments being, you know, gambled for, whatever, where is that connected to, you know, Esther? I, I do not know. But see, again, it goes back to what I said at the very beginning, is that 
if you don't have an understanding of the Holy Spirit, if you're not in that place of faith, you don't want it to say those things. You're going to want it to say something else. Oh, this must be it. I always remember Pastor Lloyd telling a story of his stepfather. I believe his stepfather was very, very ill. And so he, and this was up in Indiana, and so Pastor Lloyd went to visit him, probably up on a family trip, went to visit him, prayed for him, and he got well. Now, I'm not saying it was necessarily miraculous, but it was, it was amazing enough that people were shocked by it. And his stepfather saw no reason to acknowledge that God did that. Hey, that, that happens. I mean, <clears throat> have any of you been in a very serious health condition in the hospital? If you haven't, I'm sure you've heard people t tell these type of stories where there's something bad going on and the doctors say, man, you know, it's serious stuff. And then the next day they come back after people prayed for you, whatever, you know, and I'm not jumping on the boat that God heals everybody. I, God's a sovereign God. But when there's been a miraculous, like, whoa, where did that go? What the doctors often say. What do doctors often say about that? And excellent, because because doctors, you know, there's there's many references to doctors having a God complex, you know, so they don't want God involved in it, you know. So when they they have to have an answer. Why, doctor? Why did you show me the CAT scan yesterday, and there was a giant tumor in my brain, and today there's no tumor there? Why? What would be the doctor's explanation? No, they would never, unless they had some sort of, some inkling of it. Well, they might say, well, maybe it was your God, you know, that did it. Or they say it was a miracle. But many times for a secular physician, they would say, well, the body has the amazing ability to sometimes heal itself. And so somehow your body just kicked in the high gear and dissolve that, you know, dissolve that um, tumor, whatever it was. That even when the evidence is right there, perfect example is when uh, Jesus told the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And the, the one, the unbeliever was in torment and Lazarus, not the one he rose from the dead, but the faithful Lazarus was in the Abraham's bosom, was resting in peace in Sheol waiting for the final you know resurrection and so Lazarus I mean the rich man says please let Lazarus dip his finger here to at least cool me off and Abraham says no there's a large, large gulf and anyway we wouldn't be allowed to do it then at least send Lazarus back because I have seven brothers and warn them of this place and that that's that's a pretty good answer there but what did Abraham say? This is classic. This is, if you want to talk about the deadness of man's heart and how they don't respond to the gospel, what did Abraham say about sending Lazarus back? Even if someone came back from the dead, there is foreshadow of Christ coming back from the dead. Even if he comes, someone came back from the dead, they will not believe. Okay, again, I go to my other favorite example. And we talked about this before. When Christ rose from the dead, the tomb's empty, an angel's sitting there, the women are talking to him, the, the tomb's definitely empty. The soldiers see this. They see the angel, they see the stone gone, they see the empty tomb, they hear the conversation, they run back to the religious leaders and say what? Jesus is gone, an angel was there, stone rolled away, he talked about him rising from the dead. Now, these are two witnesses. What does the Jewish text say, the law about accusing someone of something? You needed to have how many witnesses? Two or more. Here, you have two witnesses if it was one guard that came back and said all of this 
he might have been kind of making up a story because he fell asleep. And the disciples came, rolled the stone away, and took the body. Two guys say, angel, empty tomb, talking to the women about him being resurrected from the dead. So the religious leaders heard the testimony. What did the religious leaders say? Did they say, oh my goodness, we just crucified the, the Messiah. Let's go find him so we can worship him too. You would think with that kind of evidence, what did they say, do you remember? She said, shh, 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 shh. Say nothing to no one. We'll pay you off. You're not going to be put to death because they should be put to death. We'll make sure you're not put to death. Here's a little bribe. Say nothing to no one. Here they had the evidence right in front of them, the testimony. They could have run down and looked at the empty tomb themselves. But because of their blindness, because of their hard hearts, they couldn't see. They didn't want to see. They couldn't see. So that's what I'm saying here. And I don't fault Jewish rabbis. It's true for anyone who's an unbeliever. They're going to look at that and go, well, it, how interesting that it sounds like the things that Jesus said, because we'll get to that. You know, today was just obviously a long introduction to this. You know, we'll get to literally compare, show you, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We'll look at the Gospels and what Jesus said about that. And we will see how it is clearly Jesus the Messiah. Yet because their hearts were darkened, they don't see. And we were the same way until that day the Lord opened our eyes. So for that we can be grateful. Yes, yes. Who's Esther? Why would Esther call herself, you know, a man? No, absolutely. Absolutely. So we'll, we'll look more into this in depth, but I wanted to give that, under, that background to you because I always wondered until I studied it, what, what do the Jews say about this? What do they believe, you know, uh, about this? Because it's some pretty obvious, you know, stuff. That, so if you have any Jewish friends that you can really easily converse with, you know, ask them about it, not to beat them over the head with it, but just say, hey, I'm really curious, you know, about this. What, does, what do you say? Because Psalm 22 is in their Bible. It's in their Torah. So be uh, interested what they say. All right. Time has ticked away. It's time to go. Any questions or comments on that since I do all the rambling? I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Yes. You know, I mean, I can see, I could give them that. Well, yes. I mean, anytime you're going through hell, this would be a prayer to pray. Yeah. There's hope, you know. Now, the one problem is, is, it, is Esther occurred before King David. Okay, I was going to ask that. I just realized that. Okay, I was going to ask So that. it couldn't be a Psalm of David. It would have to have been written by Esther okay. for that to be true. For her to, you know, come up with this. Right, so. it was before David. right, because that was when they were in captivity. David came after the captivity because they came back. No, 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 no. David was before. Because David, the kingdom was divided after Solomon, when Solomon died in his book. So no, David definitely was before this. So she could have had access to it. Now, the fact that she was living in Persia, God's names never mentioned. They were not a religion. They had no interest in going back to the Holy Land. It surprises me that Esther would quote, you know, this, because there's no other reference. That would have been a good reference to put in there, that Esther, in her agony, cried out to the Lord from the Psalm of David, you know. Hi. Anything else? Yes, sir. I think if you don't want to believe in anything, you just write what you want. Yeah. Okay, because it says to me, the second book of Judah, it said all scriptures, all scriptures mm -hmm. are inspired. Yep, God breathed. Okay, now, John, when he was looking for the book of Revelation, that's not the, the Jewish custom told him about the planes and the nuclear bomb. That was inspired. Mm -hmm. So I believe that David was under the 
Sure. Sure. Yeah. 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 David may not have been suffering this specific kind, you know, when he talks about his hands being pierced or whatever. It could be in his mind the hyperbole of how much I'm being tormented by my enemies, not realizing that he's being inspired by the Lord and actually writing what's literally going to happen a thousand years later. So, all right. Father, thank you for meeting here with us. I do pray that we were encouraged. Uh, if, if nothing else, Father, it, it inspires us to study your word, to dig in, Father. Lord, I pray you would use us and, and use this psalm uh, in, in some way that we could share it with, with others. The how uh, to, to point out that Jesus wasn't just a historical figure, but the fact that he was written about so specifically regarding his crucifixion a thousand years prior to it must mean the crucifixion was important. So Lord, let that ring true in our hearts this day that we might continue to grow in your grace. Bring us back again in your perfect timing. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Great to see you all. And uh, see you soon. Who wrote